Good morning, everybody. Here we are, we're live, and it is Tuesday. Tomorrow's public holiday, so if you are um, if you're struggling to wake up this morning, just think about how you won't be doing that tomorrow. That's the best feeling in the whole world. Right. Yes, uh, chilly, but not the end of the world. Sia says that he has like a, a Swedish sauna going on in his house at this time of the morning. <laughs> talking about the uh, Swedish men that he invites around on a <laughs> Monday night after we recorded a successful TV show just to help warm up his apartment. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we're joined this morning by somebody who, by popular demand, she yes. was on for uh, Collectomania the other day and people said, oh my God, that girl's just so cool. We thought her <laughs> husband was cool once, but now we think she's the one who makes it interesting. So, I'll tell uh, her that all the time. Yeah, don't tell Rich. I was going to say don't tell him because you know he's going to get upset. Um, <laughs> Jazz, just uh, you've, your microphone is on your thingy, so every time you move it like that, it goes. Oh, okay, sound. hold on. You know, I feel uh, like I need to unplug one ear all the time because I'm so loud. That's no, why that's I was better. so. You want to regulate I was, yourself. I was, I was, yes, I was so no. shocked when you when you messaged and you said everybody, you know, I got all these mails saying they enjoyed you because I thought. Oh, usually when people hear my voice, they hear this. Ah, oh, Mr. No. Shaman. Since the um, Kardashians have been on TV, you sound quite normal. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but, I've had an op, hey? I've had an what op. op. What up? I had like, I had, uh, when I was 26, I had uh, these nodule things on my vocal cords uh, yeah. that I had uh, lasered off. And then I had a really hectic uh, septum operation. So I actually studied musical theater. I was going to be a singer. And then yeah. almost almost an entire octave was was taken from me. And now I paint. Did, so. you, did you sound very na uh, nasal? Because I don't, when, when did yes. you have this done? How old were you? Uh, I was 26 when I had the op done. When did I meet you? Because, okay, so let's just remind everybody in case they don't know who the hell we're talking about. So Jasmine Mulholland is with us this morning. Uh, Jasmine is, uh, she, she was on Collectomania the other day talking about all her weird collections of crockery and Christmas decorations and bizarre stuff that she keeps in her house. And we had, we had a flood of emails from people who said, please bring her back. She just has the best energy in the world, which you do. And, and um, I've known you for years. I knew you before Rich knew you. Mm-hmm. Yes, so we met. I'll never, I'll never forget this. We met, <laughs> we met on my 18th birthday. I actually oh, met wow. you, Ben, and mm -hmm. I met Dave Kabuka the, all the very same night. Uh, right. So what yeah, had happened was, where, where were we? It was like what Tiger Tiger or something. Yeah. It was a Tiger Tiger, but I had uh, won a competition and I was on the cover of a magazine, and they had done right. an interview with me. And they had said to me, if you could hang out with any South African celeb, who would it be? And I was like, Gareth Cliff. That's who I would oh. want to hang out with. And those, um, for Prince. Those, are the, those are the days when I had some pulse here. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah, like, oh, please, who the hell would, you, who would choose that answer? <laughs> and for Prince, they had actually changed the question to, if you could date any South African oh. Celeb, who would it be? Wow. And I was furious about it. Yeah. And I was standing at like the on the balcony, and I saw you down at the bar, and I thought, I mean, I was full of juice that night. I thought I have to rectify this. I must. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So off I went, and I pushed through the crowd. And uh, I mean, I must have sounded like ah ha zangara. That's how I must have sounded. Like without a doubt, you were probably like ew. <laughs> what is this? And I think who I just said, this? I think I said something like, listen, no offense. Um, yeah. Because back Which, then, my <laughs> always, always, I mean, like, what a shit way to start any conversation. <laughs> but because there's actually that uh, there's there's a there's a comedy show called The Fast Show, and there's a woman who's from South Africa on The Fast yeah. Show. Have you ever seen it? And she nah. goes, she's busy. She's at the at the checkout. She's like the the shop girl at the at the checkout counter, and the, she's going through people's stuff and like she'll be scanning someone's I don't know washing powder and she'll go hmm and she'll scan the, their lipstick and go hmm and then they'll she'll scan their their choice of tampons for example she'll go hmm listen i don't know about you but no offense i wouldn't buy that kind unless i had an extremely heavy flow. what is this show called 
it's called the fast show it's old it was it was from like the the 90s or the or the early 2000s but it's a british comedy show and this character who so goes no, no offense is a south african <laughs> character and it's so <laughs> irritating so yeah what a way to start the sentence so you go no offense but yeah i mean it was Listen, Gareth, back then my taste in men was very different, right? I mean, they were like six foot. They looked like they had to be dying of anorexia. They were as white as milk Ooh. covered in tattoos. I mean, it was like a whole, I still dig the tattoo thing, but yeah, sure. it was just very different. And I think I just came up to him and said, like, no offense. <laughs> I do don't want to date you. I just want to hang out. <laughs> like, I let's just be friends. Like, I, I totally mean, friend zoned you that night. <laughs> Right, but I wasn't. I don't think I was reading your interview anyway, so I didn't even know that, that was in the interview. Yeah, the context I was just, of all I need, of this. Yeah, I mean, I needed. To, can you imagine? I like am standing there, and some rando is like, "Oh, that girl Tony wants to no. get down with you." No, I'm no, like, no, "Fuck no, off!" No. no, I don't. Anyway, but, and um, then I'm, I met you and Ben and and Dave Kabuka the same night, who I'm yeah. still very close to, by the way. Well, I mean, <clears> those two are both terrific people, so I'm glad I was at least in good company because usually when mm. people say. Yeah, we met once. I go, where? And I'm, I'm nervous <laughs> about what they say next because it could be, you know, it could be anywhere. It could be strip club. It could be all <laughs> kinds of places. So. <laughs> yeah, By the so way, that's... just so you know, Jasmine, because um, you, you're new to the show, uh, if, if you ever bring up strippers, Sia goes, and he starts looking disapprovingly. <laughs> oh, does he? Very disapproving of strippers. He's got a huge superiority complex about strippers. No, no, no. Yeah, no. you live in Joburg. I mean, you live in like, like Strip Central. What are you talking Strip about? Strip Central. <laughs> yeah. It's very mean about I mean, have them. you been to the Grand? I used to go there just to eat. Yeah. I, I, I do. have I do. gone 26 years without catching any sort of STD, and I'd like to carry on my streak of well, being you, a CD free. You see you that it's, again, you see what I mean about judgmental, like straight Does away. It he not goes, happen? Strip it to STD. Let me tell you where the STDs are. The STDs are meeting normal people. Strippers can't afford oh. to get an STD and they don't work. That's I true. would like That's to very take true. and swab to that pole and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there was a there was a time where I landed up some at like some strip club. I don't know which one it was, but I was actually scared yeah. to touch things. I was like, I'm gonna catch the Ebola on the walls here. Yeah. It was yeah. sick. like it was I mean, really genuinely uh, sick. Some strip clubs are revolting, but I can tell you, for those girls, that's their business. They have to keep things operating at you know peak capacity through um through all the tough times. So. Don't think for a second that a stripper is dirtier than any other kind of girl. In fact, probably way more uh, uptight about what uh, exactly she's doing down there. She's keeping things. See, if you're paying a thousand rand to get into a strip club, it's yeah. I can guarantee you it's clean. Well, it better be know. clean at that price. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, who runs the Grand, has got obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not a joke. He's he's not looking for attention. He doesn't do it to to make people laugh. He is so uptight about cleanliness that I reckon you could probably, you could eat off the floor at the Grand, and it would be better than eating off the kitchen counters in any of our houses. <laughs> yes, face. <laughs> I promise you, you, you haven't been. No. See, right. the Grand well, is like amazing. I would live there. No, I've the been girls. There. I don't know about the the men's loo, but the girls' toilet. I mean, oh it's like God. a perspex wall of perfume. You walk in, there's like this flush supply of makeup and toiletry. I was like, oh yeah, my God, I've died and gone to heaven. What is the most, what, what is the largest collection of cologne that you've ever seen in one place in your life? The Grand. Yeah. Really? It's oh, you walk in there. If you're a guy and you, you will find pretty much whatever you're looking for. It's there. And you help yourself. You for everyone to up. use? Well, yes. everybody Yes, I mean you—it's ca all covered in the entrance fee. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean you're, pay, you're paying a thousand rand for that unopened toothbrush and toothpaste oh. and earbuds and cotton yeah, pads everything. and whatever. Everything you need. Like I mean, listen, world. I'm sure you even get like a cologne for your funny. I'm certain. <laughs> I mean, you do. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, morning, look, since in South Africa we don't have one dollar bills. Good morning, ladies of the night. They're probably picking mm -hmm. off coins from their bodies because yeah, <laughs> it's really. like two red coins. 
You see, again, he's just being so disparaging about Good these Good morning, strings. ladies. It's unbelievable. <laughs> After a hard <laughs> Are you saying like peeling a coin off their body? <laughs> <laughs> those are tips. They worked hard, those ladies. <laughs> They put yeah. like a special lotion on to make sure that the coin's very really secure. Just, it's amazing how little, how little fear knows about how this world works. It's just you completely, and you're not an ignorant, you're not an ignorant person, so you, you actually Ooh. know quite a lot about the world, but you are just so ignorant about this stuff. It's like know. when, like, like a housefrau from the northern suburbs of Joburg talking about how, how it is in the townships. That's how you it's sound. That, it's that and what happens in prison. I'm okay not knowing anymore because I just don't need to be in that world. No, thank you very much. See, I was in a, I was in, a, I, was in a, I was in a similar situation to you with regards to how you think many, many, many yeah. years ago. And then one night, me and my girlfriends were like, "Let's go to teasers and you know see what this is all about." And we actually ended up at tease hers, which is like. Eh. Ugh. Don't. I mean, there was this guy who came so out. Is, I'm not these kidding. are the the male strippers for women. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we go upstairs, and there's this guy that comes out, and he's he's like a shortish but like very stocky buff guy, and he's got oh. these tiny little like cheeky shorts on, and he starts dancing on the pole. Now let me tell you, there is nothing sexy about a man, a man mm. moving like that on a pole. Personally, I was like, what is that? I would much rather watch a woman dance on a pole, but it is not cool to see like a man dance. Like it's not a vibe well, for me. Do you know who do you know who is a serious pole dancer now? A guy. He's taking it up, he's taking it very seriously, and he does it um he's doing it like every day and he's taking part in a competition this weekend. And Siv Ngesi, who's a rugby yes. player. Macho, macho man. And he, he has done two things recently, which I think are, you know, when people talk about brave, you know, these days to be brave, all you have to do is, you know, uh, say to people that, oh, I have um, a point of view that the mainstream media don't, then you're brave in this world right now. But Sivan Gessie's done two pretty brave things. I mean, it's not my cup of tea, but good luck to him. I mean, I would never have uh, pegged him for this stuff. First thing he does, he goes and learns how to be a, a pole dancer. And Sivan Gessie puts on like a speedo and he does pole dancing. And he says it is the best fitness he's ever done in his life. We've got to get him on the show, please, Sia, because he must explain. Okay, okay but that's a fitness thing. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. a different, you know, when no, you're no, trying no. to. When you're trying but to you, sex a girl up and you're like, mm. no, but you, you did say this, <laughs> it's, it's nothing. And, and listen, I mean, I, I, to me, the, the pole is not like the, you know, it's not the reason I go to a strip club, but Siv, reckons that the the pole dancing is the best thing he's ever done and he he's no slouch you know when the guy does something he does it properly the other thing that he's done that we need to talk to him about is he has um he's developed his own drag queen personality it's like his drag queen alter ego and he's he dresses up in full drag and he goes to like these drag shows and i i would never if you'd lined up a, a thousand men Siv would have been the last guy I would have pegged to do that. Huh? Gareth, um, the, I have... Mm. Uh, Siv's alter it. ego is, is Savannah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. See, I'm not making it up. I see this on his Facebook. Talking about account. like just men you would never peg. So I, mm. have, I have a lot of... of um, Gay friends. I even ha I have this. I had a bridesman at my wedding, but um, <laughs> he, <laughs> we tried to get him a pink, a pink kilt, but we just we couldn't find one. Um, anyways, <laughs> so oh. I used to at university go to like church with him, but it was a church for like gay dudes and only oh, yeah. dudes. Oh. There were no lesbians there. They were just dudes, and there were guys. When I walked, and I thought my gay doll was like spot on. I used to walk mm. in there every Sunday and think, oh, my God, that's like my friend's dad. It wasn't really my friend's dad. But, like, guys you no. would never pig right. to – because I think, you know, I think there's a, a fallacy around what a gay man looks like and how a gay yeah. man should behave. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's really interesting to, to hear that, actually. Mm. Well, I, I've got to get Siv on to explain this stuff to us because it's not something I would uh, ever have thought he could do. And, and yet he's doing both and he's, he's apparently loving it. So 
What do we know? So, Jazz, listen, I wanted to ask you about something else that you're doing at the moment, which is pretty cool. Um, I saw on your social media you are busy promoting a, a Musgrave gin, which it appears you have you've designed the labels, and it, it appears you are the artist who has put mm-hmm. those those labels together. Now we've had I've I've had I've had discussions with um, the woman who started Musgrave Gin. What's her name? Simon. Simon, she's awesome. She lives in in like KZN or something, doesn't she? No, she lives like in Cape Town. Oh, she's in Cape Town. Oh. All right, yeah, so tell us, tell us the story of this and how this came together because you talk about people with hidden talents. I mean, we know you can paint, but uh, designing a gin lo- ba- label, that's pretty cool stuff. So it's not the gin label, but I'll explain to you what happened. Oh, so um, so during I mean, lockdown... Me, uh, hmm? No, me, I know nothing. Tell me the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> I know, I'm about to school you. Hold on to your boots. Oh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so during lockdown, uh, I had a friend who was uh, getting married and she had a bachelorette on the way. So I decided to um, paint a bottle of gin, like, an, like on the bottle, because uh, I usually give people gifts, like I'll paint on a bottle of wine or, um, you know, I give them art and then I give them something that's functional at the same time. I'm all about like functionality. Anyway, right. so I painted, I painted a painting onto this gin bottle. And uh, before I posted it on social media, I actually contacted someone and I said to her, listen, you know, with regards to rights and all sorts of things, I'm about to post something as my product that's actually your, uh, well, like part of your product. Is it okay if I tag you in this? And yeah. she said, sure, no problem. And then um, she contacted me shortly after that and she said, listen, you know, let's get together and talk about doing a collab. And um, we went for coffee and she told me her grandfather's story, which is incredible. He's it's a man named Ma- uh, Maurice Boone. And he was mm-hmm. literally like a pirate. He sailed on a ship and it, it's just like a phenomenal story. Um, and I came home and I was so inspired because, you know, obviously I hadn't been able to travel. So I was sitting at home dying for adventure. And I, I actually painted her a painting and um of of maurice boone and she actually took the painting and she scanned it and um it's now the box i brought it, i brought one to show you wow. so this is actually a painting oh. <laughs> that she's that she's turned into the box um yeah. and then the bottle it's just got like little pieces that's amazing it's so cool. Um, and if you stack, like if you stack three, the design, I mean, the design around the box, the design on the actual box and how the designers put it together is phenomenal. So if you stack. Show us, uh, show us that box again. It's, uh, I just want to look at that nicely. God, that is amazing. Musgrave 11. Okay. And then it's got your, your name there. And then you, that's the pirate. That's, so that's, uh, that's, that's her. That's her. That's Maurice. Yeah. And there he's on the ship. That's, that is fantastic. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. So they well actually go on. They actually thank you. They go on sale today. Um, I don't know if all the stockers, but I know you can get them at like Riverside uh, in Joburg. Uh, Woodstock Liquors has got them, I think. Um, and then you can buy obviously from Musgrave online. Right. <clears throat> well, it's always yeah. I love these. Um, you see, this is where the the really clever brands have have used opportunities like this to make themselves that much more interesting and and i think that if if just like with with people if you've got a bit of personality to your brand it suddenly takes things up a level and this is how Mm. you add personality to a brand by doing stuff like this so well done to simon that's very clever and and well done to Mm. you okay so thank you are you you doing like a gallery exhibition at the same time yeah i've currently got a show on at the moment it's called jagged and it's right. uh, on at Candice Berman Gallery in uh, Joburg. It's been on for like a month, and I think it ends now on the twenty third next 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 week. So you've still um, got but we got to go. you've got a week to yeah. go and see if you want to go and see um, Jasmine's uh, show. It's on at the Candice Berman Gallery. It's on, on until twenty third of June, and. Um, I think it's just so cool that you've done this with with Musgrave Gin. Um, I like the fact that you used your maiden name for your your painting. My mother's also she's married to my dad, obviously, so her surname is Cliff. But mm-hmm. she used her maiden name when she paints, and mm. uh, I think that's because you obviously Why started painting before, before Rich got to like take some of the proceeds. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know what? I have a great maiden name. I'm, I love it. It's very dear to me. Oh. I hang on to it. I, like I cling onto my maiden name. Um, I actually Jasmine want to put it back Jasmine. into my name as a as a second a name, name, just to yeah. just to have it there. But anything I do um, creatively or, or artistically, I do under um, uh, my my maiden name, my children's books, maiden name, every everything that I do uh, creatively goes under Jagger. Yeah, it's a, a very cool name. name. It's it's a rock star name. It is a rock thank star you. name. Mm. No, it is. I can thank my mom. My mom. Tracy says, ooh, the Musgrave gin is amazing. Gorgeous bottles and labels. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, so Tracy. Yes. Um, lots of talk, <clears throat> says Sean, about pegging this morning. So <laughs> someone else sent a message just now. I've lost it somewhere. But they said that pegging is apparently actually a term for something that uh, women do to their straight husbands with uh, strap-ons. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. So when we say... When we say oh. we wouldn't peg Siv and Gessie to do this, that's what we... <laughs> that's oh, my God. That, so that escalated very quickly. I didn't Let's know that clarify that, that now. Me there. I, yes. Yeah, I just want to apologize for that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't <Yeah>. know. <laughs> uh, man. Uh, here's a nice one. Anushka says, I woke up to a fabulous text from the lab. I am COVID positive. Finally, it is happening to me right in front of my face, and I just cannot hide it. Yeah, but so uh. what? You know, I, I know so many people. Oh, who've that's been... a song. Oh, sorry. I was late yeah. there. I was like, finally, shit has happened to me. When you guys think that song, it sounds like that, that show host that came in and he was like, can you play, can you please play the Reebok on the mic? And the guy was like, what? Have you heard it? <laughs> and he's like, is it the, the Reebok on the mic? <laughs> so anyway, um. Anushka, I wouldn't worry about it. Just because you test positive for COVID doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a, a terrible time of it. Some people test positive and have absolutely no symptoms, and some people end up in hospital. I got an email yesterday from somebody. I didn't expect to uh, to hear about this for uh, you know from from someone in this situation. Apparently, Mark Pilgrim. You remember Mark Pilgrim? Mm -hmm. Someone sent me a screenshot of him. Hi guys, this is this is from Mark Pilgrim. A little update on day six. After starting to feel better, X-rays reveal COVID pneumonia has developed in my right lung, which is being treated by my doctor. Oh. Fortunately, my breathing is still good. I'm able to be at home. Here's a little note from me, and then he sent like this picture of him in bed. And so apparently, Mark Pilgrim is, it hit him really hard. You Gareth, we just had a friend who was put in an induced coma for two weeks because of COVID pneumonia. Jesus. Yeah, they put they tried to pull him out like twice, and every time he came out, he was so aggressive, and he like tried to yank all the wires and the pipes out of his face. So they actually oh kept God. him uh, in the in the coma until he was off the respirator, yes. and then they only took him out. And that was like two weeks. I think he was in a in an induced coma. It's hard to, it's hard to tell who it affects because I mean, Mark is mostly fit, and he you know he, he did have cancer. He had uh, cancer before, and then he went into and remission. The heart attack. Yeah, he's had heart problems. So obviously, he was a prime candidate because of the cancer and the heart problems. Um, they they are comorbidities for COVID. But you know, most people like there's this girlfriend of mine that said that she got sick the other day, and and she's been in bed for a couple of days. She felt quite shitty, but she's on the mend now. Um, and some people don't feel a damn thing. They're like, I'm COVID positive, but I feel like I did the day before. Mm. So not to knows? make light of the situation, because I really am not, but it's quite reaffirming or inspiring isn't exactly the right word, to know that your body can make it through something mm. like this. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when someone has been cancer-free for years and they're stronger than ever, it's kind of this thing of like, wow, you know, my body is still going, still pumping, still working. Mm. So what does Mbulela say? Stay positive, test negative, everybody. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I hate to remind people of what's so obvious, but life is a zero-sum game. So you do, you will die. Something is going to get you. Mm. And like it's it's not a it's not a, a thing everybody likes to hear, but it is the truth. You just have to come to terms with the fact that if it isn't COVID, something could happen to you, and something's going to happen to you. Apparently, not the me. other day they, they published a study. Yeah, you think so, Sia? They published a study. I'm not going to die. I'm going to take a final bow on the stage. 
you know and how then they die. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know how we all think we could live forever. I mean, I've often said that I want to live forever and and I don't whatever they can develop scientifically, medically to make me live forever, I'll take it. Um but apparently they've discovered that there might be an absolute upper limit on how long human beings can live. So Ooh. they were doing um, research around this longevity and you know I mean, we spoke to a dude just last year or the year before. He's like the world expert on longevity. And he was saying, oh, no, you know, you can keep extending life. And if we can find a way to stop cells from aging. And at the end of each chromosome, there's a thing called a telomere, which if they can figure out a way to get the telomeres to stop degenerating, su supposedly the cells can keep dividing and you'll keep being healthier and healthier and healthier or younger and younger and younger if we can find ways to even retard the growth further. But these scientists have discovered this week or last week or recently because of studies they've been doing for the last while that the mm -hmm. absolute upper limit might be 150, that we may only be able to live up to about 150 because the body just cannot fix itself fast enough. Beyond a hundred. No, I heard Richard say. I heard Richard say the other day was he was chatting to somebody online and he said something about you know the age the ages between eighty five and ninety is like the fastest growing demographic at the moment. I don't know how mm -hmm. true that is. Mm -hmm. um, my God, that is like my worst nightmare. I want to oh, die yeah. young. Imagine I, walking I, honestly, around. I have no walking. interest in being an old person. Walking the streets and you're surrounded by eighty to ninety year olds smelling of piss <laughs> and. Can yeah. you imagine? And you're like Benjamin Benjamin buttoning your way through life because yeah. somebody's like retarded your cells. No. <laughs> no, fuck no. <laughs> no. That is like my worst nightmare. I do not want to uh, grow old at all. That's why Botox is a thing. I don't want to look that's why I put Botox in my face because I like I have no interest in looking like a chamois cloth. <laughs> <laughs> and you see you are a big believer in botox as well what yeah. day is what day absolutely i i freaked out a little earlier this year but i'm going to commit soon because oh you haven't see... done it no see ya he's, he's, he's 25 years old jasmine 26 ah, okay. and the extra you know how old i am now, not 25, yeah. but I look it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got good. a great doctor. <laughs> let's um, do, let's do some possible. headlines. Uh, we got to look at some of the headlines going on, and then we'll get back to you and your uh, your your Botox doctor because that sounds interesting. Uh, so <laughs> you, you probably heard the story of um, Eteguini Mayor Zandile Gumede, and she said she would wait patiently until the conclusion of the case against her and 21 others because she was confident that justice will be served. She and several other co-accused appeared in the Durban High Court on Monday on charges of fraud, corruption, money laundering, and racketeering. And um, she sat there and she's, uh, she's chilled. She says, oh, don't worry, it'll all be fine. Suspects are linked to the fraudulent deal uh, for waste collection in Etequini that amounts to 320 million Rand and Zandile Gumede couldn't keep her filthy hands out of the till for that deal. And My she, God. <laughs> yeah, I know the number of counts. Listen to this. She, <laughs> I don't know if she can count because she thinks she'll get off on all of these counts. <laughs> the number of counts against Gumede and her co accused add up to 2,793 different crimes. Oh, gosh, that's a lot. How big is how big is the accused party? Um, <laughs> I'm looking at it now. Um, they say, <laughs> you mean how many of them are in the court? Yeah. Um, twenty one plus her is twenty two. Wow. Twenty two people. So if we divided, <laughs> I'm going to get my calculator for this. Hang on. Yeah, do that. If we divided two thousand seven hundred and I just want to get two two seven nine three is the number. Mm. Um. Two seven nine three, and divide that by twenty two people. It means each of them have got one hundred and twenty six charges, if it's equal. So at least wow. one hundred and twenty six charges, um, are on average for each of them. Now that is a huge amount of corruption. Huge, huge amount of corruption. Dating back how long? Oh, this this has gone back about five or six years. Um, wow. 
Yeah, so she's been at it. I mean, she's really been digging right into the back of that till. Um, <laughs> they apparently, they apparently, you know, put her on. She's got on, the till. I don't know what you're talking. She's like she actually is. taken the till. She pulled it out of the wall and she. And it's power cable. <laughs> she's even got the socket. She's so, pulled yeah. the socket. So apparently, they're going on trial on the 18th of July next year, 2022, as a possible trial date. So oh, my dear birthday. Yes, and she's going to wait a little while to find out, you know, how she's going to make a difference on Madiba's birthday next year. Oh, don't bring <laughs> oh, Madiba so please. And it's my mother's birthday also. It's my mom's and birthday my, too. And my dad's, the 18th of July. Oh, yeah. nice. They always get All a public right. holiday. It's some bullshit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't understand why that isn't a public holiday, but all these other public holidays, which, I mean, who cares about Women's Day, really? Mm. Well, I, know, I know women who don't even care about it. Oh, uh, you're going to set people off. The ANC Treasurer General, Paul Mashatile, said there would be no holy cows when the party moved to reduce its staff complement. Apparently, Mashatile confirmed on 702 this week that the ANC is carrying out an audit of its employees with the aim of significantly cutting down on staff. <laughs> the ANC cutting down on staff. Oh, on Tuesday, Latuli House employees were expected to demonstrate outside ANC headquarters as they are yet to receive their salaries from May. Because remember, the ANC is broke. The party has been growing its staff as new leaders hire their own staffers, while those who serve previous party leaders also remain on their books. You see, they can't fire anybody because it's, it's like jobs for pals. So mm. once you hired someone, you hired them for life, and they're dependent on you. It's like having a child. See, That's I don't know. Like. I don't know enough about politics to get involved in this kind of conversation. Like, I just try to well, steer clear of that stuff. That's fine, but let me explain it to you this way: When you get jo a job in the ANC, it's like being being born into a rich family, and your family just have to keep cutting checks to you every day no matter how old you get because you're never independent you can never actually get out there into the world and get a job for yourself if you're in the anc they will find you sheltered employment somewhere. and that's why the, the the salary bill for the government is so high and for the anc is so high because they can just never fire people they just keep mm. hiring, hiring hiring new people and their salaries go up and up and up as they stick around unbelievable wow, i didn't a, know that yeah, that's the ANC for you in a nutshell. Um, News 24 this morning are reporting that former DA members are suing Musi Maimane for a million rand each. Wow. <laughs> the, I think the ANC is the only kind of party with problems. Four former DA members are suing Musi Maimane for one million rand in reputational damage. Oh. They, got, they got the legal ball rolling last week when they lodged papers in the Western Cape High Court. Who are they? You'd think they were people with reputations, huh? No. Trust me, you've never heard of these people. Suzette Little. Anybody heard of her? No. No? Didn't think so. Sean August. Anybody heard of him? Negative. Mm -mm. Greg Barnardo. That's nope. another no. And Tulani Stemel. Tulani Stemel. Oh, I know that person. Oh, do you so, know, do you know really? Tulani? No. Oh, I, just, I, okay. I was just taking the first. <laughs> Apparently, no. apparently, they resigned from the city of Cape Town Council and the DA in October of 2018, and they have decided to go after my money, who was then the DA's national leader, because he wrote in his newsletter that they were all implicated in tender irregularities, and it turns out they weren't. So he was given a letter of demand in November of 2018 to apologize for making false and defamatory statements, but he ignored it. In the court papers filed last week, one of them stated my money's statements had been concerning and are wrongful and defamatory to the plaintiff and were widely published to a large and international audience. So here are a bunch of people who are suing for reputational damage when they never, in my opinion, had a okay. reputation to start with. I mean, where Good do they luck. expect that money is going to come from? Yeah, I mean... If, like they, if they win, let's say, you know, no. let's say they win the case, where do they think that money is going to come from? Mm, Musi, my money is private. He's got four million rand lying around. Oh, my God. Definitely not. Anyway, let's see what happens. I mean, it's funny. I think it's hilarious. You know, politicians suing politicians. It's great. Well, you let us yeah. know and you can speak to us in, like, you know, politics for dummies terms because I'll need that conversation. Um, you know who Kenneth Kaunda is? No. 
Kenneth Coenda is the former president of Zambia, and he's a bit of a hero to um, people who were involved in our struggle because he gave a, 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 a forward operating base and kind of sucker in terms of food and a place to stay and go to an exile in Zambia to a lot of people who were in the struggle in South Africa. But Kenneth Kaunda is, I, I thought he was dead already, but he's 97 years old. He's still alive in Zambia. He's still alive, Kenneth Kaunda. Amazing. Like a really... between, what? I've been fluctuating between, I think he looks like a great 97 to, mm -hmm. whoa, he looks like a very stern and serious man to, Oh, he actually looks so old and cute. I don't know. I can't. Can, I can't you, pull a, can you pull a picture up? I didn't see this. I'll, guy. I'll get your picture. I'll get you a picture quickly of what uh, Kenneth Kaunda looks like, and you can decide. I see what yeah. this guy looks like. Uh, we'll, we'll let you decide. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now you'll make me sound cuckoo if you don't find maybe a, a picture from a good <laughs> angle. Because <laughs> no, my, my initial just, response though was, "Oh, ninety-seven. Huh. I don't know if this is a very recent picture, but it is the story. Mm. It, it's the picture included in the story that I'm reading from. So there he is, Kenneth Cohen. There we go. That's not a 97. No. He's 97? No, I think it might be an old pick, to be fair. Uh, but because that's like, what well, he looks like. That's I like he was, 70. He looks good. He I looks thought he was good. good already. I, I had, honestly, it, it, it shocked me to even read this story to see that he's still alive. I thought the guy died a long time ago. There he is. Yeah, Kenneth that guy's been doing Botox since he was your age. You see, that's yeah. that's how yeah. you're gonna look when you're 97. <laughs> right. If you, you know, start he, now. He knows what he's no, doing. I don't even want to laugh properly. <laughs> anyway, the Zambian government. It's amazing how some governments have to call for prayers for someone to stay alive. Um, but Thoughts they and didn't prayers. Need, they didn't need your prayers, guys. You can calm down. The um. Mm. The former Zambian president has been admitted to a military hospital. According to a short statement, the 97-year-old has not been feeling well and requested Zambians and the international community to please pray for him. His office further stated that the medical team at the Maina Soko Medical Center was doing everything possible to ensure he recovered. He was a leading figure in his country's independence movement and served as the first president of Zambia. Look at how long this guy was president for. From 1964... Until 1991. Let's do the uh, maths there, because I mean, we know we won't Why would he? I don't understand at 97 why you would ask people to pray that you live longer. Maybe yeah, he's I waiting mean, for a letter from the Queen. Exactly. Well, and he's like, matter. let me just let me just Hold make on. You, you make such a good point. At 97, you should be praying that you would die and be released yes. from this mortal coil because no one wants to be 97. Can you imagine how uncomfortable a 97 year old body is? Do you know, I do, I do ceramics with a, with a woman who is 87. Her name yeah. is Maureen. She is my absolute spirit animal. The first time I ever met her, she was reversing out of a drive and this car was coming that she didn't see. And he just started <laughs> tooting at her and she stuck her old arm out the window and she went, it's <laughs> just, I love her. And this is, she's amazing. She is absolutely hysterical. She has, me, she has me in hysterics every day in class. But she says to me, like, she lives in an old age home and she tells us yeah. stories about how um, uh, they did an Easter egg hunt for these people. And she was like, what What were they thinking? They're, like, burying Easter eggs around the garden and everyone's in, like, a Zimmer frame and, like, a, like a what do you call it? A, um, yes. Oh, yeah. my, like a wheelchair. She's like, how do they expect us to get into the, onto the grass? <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that she said, you know, like, I just, I want to go now. Like, all my buds are dead. Like, everyone, um, like, all her friends. Like, why would this guy want to live longer? I mean, yeah. only for the letter from the queen would I push for 100. That is it. Yeah, and I mean, her husband didn't even make it to 100, Prince Philip. So, if he didn't get his letter, who the hell cares if you do? I wonder if she still wrote it, like just in memory of him, because his birthday was like a month later, two months later. Mm. 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 Anyway, Kenneth Kaunda, 97, so they're praying for him to keep living, poor old bastard. Yes. And he was president of um, of Zambia for a very long time, which, you know, in Africa, years. 27 years is as long wow. as Nelson Mandela. It's as long as Nelson Mandela was in prison, basically. Um I don't know how we can still celebrate people who hold on to power for 27 years, but there we are. Um, okay, in other news, 
And we've got one more headline that we have to do today. Uh, this is for, about Maradona. So apparently Maradona's this nurse... It's not yeah. going anywhere, anytime soon. Maradona's nurse has told prosecutors he was just following orders. So here's the, here's the synopsis. A nurse accused of neglect in Diego Maradona's death told Argentine prosecutors on Monday he was following orders not to disturb the football icon while he slept. Ricardo Almiron, who's 37, was Maradona's nighttime carer and was one of the last people to see him alive. He's suspected of lying when he claimed that Maradona was sleeping and breathing normally hours before he died. An autopsy revealed he was dying at the time. Now, again, here are a whole bunch of people who are childish enough to think that Maradona would live forever. It's like the people who believe Kenneth Kaunda will live, for, live forever, although we've got more evidence that Kaunda will live forever because he's 97. Maradona died a whole lot younger than that, but probably because of the coke. Anyway. Well, so this guy is now on the trial because they go, well, if he'd been paying more attention, Maradona would have lived longer. I have to ask again, would it have been good for the world if Maradona had lived any longer? He was already an embarrassment for the last 15 years of his life. He really was. And I'm a big Maradona fan. But do the Argentinian people really think that it would have been a good idea to keep that guy going for another 10 years? Really? I think they do. I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. You're exactly right. <laughs> All right. <sighs> I love that, um, that, that friend of yours, Maureen, that you talked about oh, just now. She's hysterical. She is uh, so funny. She is so funny and she's so full of shit. She is hilarious. And, uh, like, Tracy, don't get in her way. Tracy says, oh, Lord, the old lady in Ricky Gervais's afterlife. Um, also, My Spirit Animal, probably the best series ever. That's that old lady who goes. Great series. Oh, it's so, so cool. That's the old lady who goes something like, um, I wish I was dead. All my friends are dead. She does, she does exactly that thing, doesn't she? Mm. Mm. All right. Um, we were talking to Jasmine about her so art sad. earlier, and it's appropriate for me to tell you that um, I mentioned the other day the long-awaited return of Tom's art. It's a great shop in Johannesburg. Well, here is something that you don't want to miss if you do live in Joburg. Tom's art is uh, having their grand opening sale, which starts tomorrow. That's on Youth Day and ends on Sunday, which is Father's Day. So you've got one, two, three or five days to get in there and get everything done. Tom's Art, they're in Cromerville, and you can make sure that you tell them that we sent you. I've been to them many times. They have the most fantastic mirrors, and they have paintings there that you can buy for your house. And if you really want to deck your house out nicely, these guys can help you do it. Tom's signature classical art, furniture, and accessories will be 50% off. Everything on the floor is 50% off, so make sure that you get to their showroom, and it is at 15 Dartfield Road. So put that into your GPS or Waze or whatever you use. 15 Dartfield Road in Cromerville, weekdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and weekends from 8 to 3 p.m. for some amazing bargains. Get along and tell them that we sent you and they'll be even nicer to you. They might even offer you a cup of tea or something. But go and have a look at Tom's Art in Cromerville and get 50% off for the next couple of days from tomorrow until Father's Day on Sunday. Look, I have my running shoes ready. I will even uh, carry. You? Yeah, I, I will even carry a man bag just to potentially swat people out of the way because I was on the Tom's Art Instagram page. And I yes. thought, Ooh, there are a couple of things very, here that I need to fight for. I mentioned to Sia that he could actually go and buy himself a throne there. You know, they've got those incredible, yeah. like, and I baroque we style. With, with, <laughs> No, no, you 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 could get one with the, like zebra skin or faux leopard skin or whatever it no! is. No. Oh yeah, no, no, it would be I fabulous. I thought you were for, joking, yeah. but well, I can those, see they it. They have the, like velvet purple with like diamond studs kind of stuff. I'm sure they can. I'm sure they can find that for you too. But the, they no, do yes, have. Yeah. You know, oh Sia no, likes, no, no, that's what I'm likes, getting. Uh, Sia likes garish stuff like that, but Tom's Art has <laughs> everything. They have everything for everybody. I mean, I've bought some very, very nice stuff there as well. I don't I've, understand I've... how I lived most of my mm -hmm. life in Joburg and never went there. You, you missed out <gasps> big missing time. Out. And, and it is, it's a little bit of a secret, so I'm glad that they're on with us to, to tell you about 
the you know the whole thing that they're doing and you can go along there and they will look after you i promise you it's just such a cool place you'll find unbelievable bargains 50 percent off for the next couple of days make and sure it's like you... antiques because i used to buy all of my stuff from um there's like that road in triumph i think it's called first avenue and it's just antique store after antique store after and like you park at the bottom and then you just walk the road so they have they have a whole lot of of really interesting pictures and they have uh, they have beautiful mirrors and they have lovely furniture but i don't i don't think it's antiques per se there are there are a couple of of uh, things that they sell which which certainly i mean would would pass for modern antiques and there are a couple of things in there that that look incredible that you won't find in any other shop in south africa but go and have a look the only way you'll know is to go and check them out so if you're in joburg mm. go to tom 15 darkfield road and uh, you can say that you heard about it here because they're going to ask you, like, how did you, how do you know about this? Um, you know, it's like that guy. You're in a special club when you hear about it on this show. Uh, Woody says, Jasmine's energy levels remind me of Nina Hasty. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I like Nina Hasty, so we'll give you the compliment. There we go, Jazz. Thank you. Yes, very, very nice. And then I do want to go to this email quickly. Hey, Gareth, I haven't touched base with you guys in a while. This is from um, someone who says, we are in this together, <laughs> which is obviously joking about Mbulelo, who says that sarcastically. Um, we're doing well in Kurdistan, though we are boiling. Um, and, and Caleb has been in Kurdistan. He works there, and he's from Zim originally, but he uh, is working in Kur Kurdistan. They're, they're boiling hot, he says. I wanted to suggest a reunion of Bulelo, Ben, and Siv. Funny, we were talking about Siv and Gessi just earlier this morning to give us an update on where sport is a year into COVID on So What Now. By the way, we've only got three shows left of So, so What Now, and one of them is tomorrow. Don't miss that. 10 o'clock tomorrow night. Um, who have we got on again? See, Antoinette Sitole, who is the sister of Hector Peterson. You know that famous picture from Youth Day 45 years ago, believe it or not. The famous picture of um, Buyisa carrying Hector Peterson's body after the police mm -hmm. had shot him. And his mm -hmm. sister ran next to the next to the body with her hands up. Mm -hmm. That sister is on our show tomorrow night. You have to meet oh, wow. her. Yeah, she's amazing. And we've got a panel consisting of um, two people who are well known to this show because we've had them on the burning platform a number of times. They are Solly Moeng and uh, Mighty Jamie, and they will debate with me some of the big issues in South Africa today. Don't miss tomorrow night's show, 10 p.m on ENCA, and that's channel 403. Begins. Yeah, we've got, after this, we've got two more shows, right? Yes. Yeah. I don't know why you're emotional about it. I walked out of there yesterday because we recorded a whole bunch of stuff, I and it was the last time I have to go to the studio. I skipped and I jumped and I danced out of the building. I don't know why Sia's so upset about it. Sia, why are you crying yourself a river about it? Because Gareth was so not into it at all. So we had finally wrapped shooting everything. And I say to Gareth, Gareth, do you want to perhaps just take one last look at the studio? He goes, nah. <laughs> That's like Richard. Enough. Richard doesn't get attached to stuff. It like blows my I mind. Don't, I don't know how you guys function like this. Say, so, do you want to mm -hmm. take something? I'm sure there's like a serviette with ENCA on it. Oh, okay, no. Do you want to pan steal a, I heard a wire? About you collecting, I heard about you and your collection with your bloody tool slip from your first it's bad. It's bad. You are it's like bad. one tool slip away from being a hoarder. Okay, stop it's, that. Exactly. Stop Thank that. You. Thank I am you. a compulsive thrower away and I'm going to come to your house no. and I'm going to like, I'm going to start a show and just clean out your house. Nope, just nope, nope, one nope, episode nope. of Sia's house. <laughs> um, so Caleb says, Caleb says, Dr. Bushkin is the best thing that happened to the show after the lovely Pumi and Blind History. And uh, Dr. Hanan Bushkin, for those who don't know, he's on every Monday. He's a, a, an amazing psychologist. He's all the rage in Joburg. Everyone who's anyone goes to him. And he is just so smart when it comes to helping us navigate our way out of craziness. Um, and I don't mean that in any disparaging way to those who actually have mental illness. But, you know, COVID has made a lot of people a little bit wild, a little bit crazy. And um, Dr. Bushkin's hel helping us out on Monday. So thanks for that, Caleb. And he also says, Sanctimonious Soapbox Mbulelo is brilliant. I loved his parody and troll of the, uh, the yappies and the G7 folks. Love you guys. I'm tempted to visit the studio this winter, provided Simpiwe is not from Wuhan anymore. And Sia oh. must get off 
off his uh, backside and give us said by Sia again. So then he's got a whole lot of other suggestions. So thanks, Caleb. Good to hear from you. There we go. Nice long email from him. From Kurdistan. Kurdistan. Now there's a place Kurdistan. Yes. Isn't that where they send um, people who have uh, who've had like incestuous sex or something? They send the worst people in the world to Kurdistan. <laughs> what? How I was going to say, there? isn't that where Borat comes from? He's no, from that's Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. <laughs> okay, Get your you wanna... stuns correct, Jess. Do you want to play a quick game? Do you want to play a quick game? Which of no, these is not, which the of these game? is not which of these is not a real country? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kurdistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Which one is not a real country? The first one. Turkmenistan. Yeah. Okay, Sia, do you want to choose one? The one that sounded like it began with a U. Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Mm. No, that's a real place. You're oh. both wrong. All five <gasps> of those countries exist. Oh. oh. Yeah, but then you can't say which one doesn't exist. That's not a game, a Gareth. Okay. <laughs> it's a trick question. It's a, I loved a trick question. When our teachers used to give us those at school. Like, it's a trick question. And you're like, oh, shit. I should have fucking been up to in the second. That is so did, funny. Did no. they just get bored naming countries? Or what mm-hmm. is what is the... What's the origin of stun? Perhaps it's just my I was just about to say, stun. yeah. So hmm. stun means country of. So okay. the Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz are people, the Turkmen, Turkoman are people, the Uzbeks are people, uh, the Kazakhs are people. So stun means country of, country of those people. So if I That's- were to have a shitload of money, become a dictator, start my own country, it would probably siestan. be siestan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Jasmine would have jasmin, jasminostan. Jasminostan is... Listen, I already have a national anthem, okay? I, like, made a national anthem when I was 10 years old. Even my family knows it. It's like... How does it... Dare it's a we thing. ask why? Go on. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, my God, my, fam- I, this, my fam- family are going to be mortified that I'm doing this. Love? <laughs> when, she has her, when she has her own country one day, this is the... And she's putting her hand on her... <laughs> All right. I know what you want. That's that's part of it. You know, Very I used serious. to tell people when I was yeah. a kid I was gonna be famous and I was gonna mm-hmm. be I was like almost certain that I had blue blood. I still do think so. Yeah. Um and that I'm going to rule a small country one day. Mm-hmm. All right, well okay. here is your let's give it a fanfare before we start. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Here she is with the anthem. Jasmine. Are you ready? <laughs> Oh, hail Queen Jasmine, you are the queen of me. You are so cool and trendy. I love your wicked ways. Your big mouth and your big hair are so cool to me. Oh, how I wish I could be just like you. (laughs) (laughs) And I promise you, my whole to... family knows these. Gareth, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag you in a in a video today of of uh-huh. Callum and I in um uh what's it called the tower in London, yes, like London Tower, Tower, <laughs> the tower London, in London, yeah. <laughs> the Tower of London, <laughs> yeah. and um we were in this curio shop and I was singing and he was standing behind me dressed as a knight with a like a sword ready. So cool. <laughs> That Sia so has cool. frozen. I have frozen I Sia in time. We've actually lost Sia. Look, she's <laughs> frozen in that position. That is such a great, I'm just going to screenshot that. Screenshot that. We're gonna that. that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep that as the, as the, the picture. Of <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, God. That is so I hilarious. like the sound of Jasmina Stun. I'm in. Yeah, someone just suggested, though, for Sia's country, we should call it Sangweni Stun. That would be Oh, better. that sounds really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that sounds- terrific. See, you're still laughing about your <laughs> anthem. Look, <laughs> you think it's that funny? I just, I, I don't, I, I find it so admirable, but also so 
shockingly scary. <laughs> and you've been He's, sitting on this, and you're you, still you, sitting on it with hope. You are just <laughs> I am. I'll never let go of this. Don't have an anthem for your country. I, I'm actually inspired this morning. Yes. <laughs> um, Woody says Sia's country would be called Shatin Pantsistan. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> No. What have I missed? No. Did you shit no. your pants? Ages ago, and it keeps coming up. Just People never knew. It. It. Uh, me? <laughs> yeah, I have neither. I have not shut my oh, pants up. You're wow. 25, Sia. How have you like let your bowels go? How did your sphinx sphincter let go? And how? At 25. We're all yeah. one shoddy meal away from. You need to kegel your bums, yeah. <laughs> That's what you need to do. Why are we doing this? Why, why, why I we, don't why, know. This is the hand gesture. This is revolting. We could go somewhere with that, but I really don't want to. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. If, uh, we've got to take a break at 7 o'clock. We will be back in a moment or two. We've got a whole lot more coming at you, including Blind History. We've got episode 10 of season 5, <laughs> and it's about the most incredible woman, Hedy Lamar which um, if you haven't heard of her, and I hadn't until we did this episode, she's going she's gonna to blow your mind. This woman is absolutely phenomenal. That's coming up next. Jeff Central. Dot. This week on Auto Central. Well, another misconception is range anxiety. I think um, for a lot of consumers who are looking into buying an EV, they don't really know what is the range of an EV. So can we unpack what those misconceptions were and what we found? Well, so, I mean, range anxiety uh, uh, shouldn't be a problem yeah. um, from, you know, into the, into the future. Maybe three, four, five years ago, range anxiety was a real thing. Um, but right now in South Africa, there's a couple of reasons. And that is cars can do way in excess of, of 200 kilometers on a, on a full charge. Catch Auto Central, SA's number one motoring podcast, every Monday at 9 a.m. send rockets to space and use complicated solutions. Want to simplicate things? Well, join Jakub Voigt, who is the CEO of Catalytic, on the Unbundled podcast. With skin in the game and a keen focus on educating and assisting you and your business, Jakub decodes all the aspects of connectivity, security, and cloud solutions. Unbundled is brought to you by Catalytic and is available on cliffcentral.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It is a Tuesday morning, and we are live this morning to look after you. Tomorrow's public holiday. Lots of people excited about that. Youth Day is the day, and don't forget to watch our TV show tomorrow night, and you can actually meet the woman who, in that famous photograph of Hector Peterson, who is running alongside him, his sister, Antoinette Sitole, who will be our guest among other really interesting people you want to hear from. And it gets pretty fiery. I mean, uh, there are arguments aplenty and lots of very, um, 
outrageous points of view about politics. Not that that is ever not a part of the mix when you are watching our show. And this morning we are joined by Jasmine Jagamal Holland and her. Uh, what is that? A cat? Oh. It's the fattest cat. That is a, quite oh. a fat cat. I will tell you, that is a very, very fat cat. What's its name? His name is uh, Sir Chester. Oh, wow. Okay. Two names. This, huh? is, this is Richard's Achilles heel, this one. Oh, really? He's, he, he, he will do whatever that cat wants? Oh, my God. Anything that cat wants. I didn't, I didn't put him down for a cat person, I must be honest he with wasn't. you. Thought, no. He wasn't. He was more of a dog guy. Tell, yeah. tell Richard, I, I found something interesting the other day that I think he must do. Um, not that he's a bored human being or that he's not um, you know, already doing plenty of interesting things. But um, anyone who's listened to this show for a while knows that Rich Mulholland's been pretty much part of the family from the get-go. Tell Rich Mulholland that I think he must become moderator of the Church of Scotland. Because it just sounds like, <laughs> it just sounds like a cool title. Um, apparently, this is a job that has been around since about the 1600s. And it used to be quite a fearsome person, like the person who was the moderator of the Church of Scotland. Usually I think he could this, do it. He was this very, um, it used to be somebody they would choose, especially because they were quite ornery and difficult and grumpy and belligerent. <laughs> and, they, they would, and they would wear only black. And they'd have the funny little. They'd have a funny little hat. Like if you look up moderator of the Church of Scotland, you'll see a bunch of really po-faced, angry-looking men who've occupied that office until probably very recently. I mean, you can imagine. Like Presbyterians are already some of the world's least humorous people. They, they, everything is deadly serious, and everything's very, very, very important, and nothing is worth laughing at, especially when you come to religion. And the moderator of the Church of Scotland used to be this fucking terrifying person. Um, so I think Rich must go for that job when he gets old. Oh, do you think he's terrifying? No, but he could be. If he, if he, get, if he gets old and grumpy, which I think everybody does eventually, then you must mm -hmm. pile him off to the, uh, the, the, the Church of Scotland as moderator. He's going to be walking through here just now. So I'm going to call him over and then just, yeah, that's you know, you can, you can tell him he's a grumpy old git. <laughs> uh, well, not yet. Not that yet, but one day. Quickly. So, yeah, one day. Um, there are all these, um, these these stereotypes about Scots that are that are, are not really true for everybody, obviously. But there are things that they say about the Scots. Now, Rich has never struck me as being mean with money, but is he quite mean? Because the Scots are quite no. um, Schnorra. You know, the, a lot of the Scots are like, "Don't waste. If you waste a single drop of marmite, we're not going to have enough for next week." That kind of thing. That's very funny. No, Richard uh, isn't like that at all. If anything, he's quite. Generous. I mean, it's me. Frugal. It's me who holds. Yeah, it's me who holds it down. Um, I remember being on an airplane once, and he was like, "I really want to buy this pencil." So I was like, "Whatever," not paying any attention. I was like, "Whatever, mm. buy the pencil." And then um, he said, "Yeah, but it's like two grand." I'm like, "The fuck, you buying a pencil for two grand?" <laughs> So actually, what does that pencil have? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> why are you buying that pencil and why is it so expensive? Uh, uh, um, but so he'll, he will, you know, there's packages that arrive here every single day. Every day a package mm -hmm. arrives here. Um, and then obviously you know about uh, the board game collection. It's just oh remind everybody. That board it's game collection is that. madness. It's unreal. Oh, hold on. It goes further down that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's enormous. Oh, it's gosh. Yeah, terrible. it's 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 quite a thing. Um, so board games arrive here on a daily basis. Um, yeah, yeah. He's, no, no, he's no, not true. he's not tight with his, his wallet at all. No. I wanted to, to talk about a story that Sia found that you may also have something to say about. An auction winner bid $28 million to fly into space with Jeff Bezos. Now, oh, Jeff wow. Bezos, I don't know why he's decided to be a part of this, but Jeff Bezos is actually going to be on the first flight that his space company is doing into, into outer space. It's so like I love these billionaires. Hmm. Um, they've, all, they've all now started comparing rockets. It's not good enough to have a fast car yeah. or yeah. to live in a mansion or to, to have a, a really hot wife. Now you also have to take a rocket into outer space. This is, the, this is the new way of proving that you're super rich, 
is to have your, your own private space jets rocket. don't cut it anymore. You must have a yeah. space rocket. Isn't it wild? And then he I wants mean, to go out. Really his wild. I mean, yeah. this will be their first proper space flight. And he said, no, I'm on board. Like, I would say, hey, uh, why don't you put someone else in first and test the thing out a little bit? And then I'll go. I'll go in the 25th flight. <laughs> But so also just only... spin it up with Jeff Bezos. Ugh. Like, yeah. but you, you know, if you're going to go to space and there's a likelihood that you're not coming back, let it be like Josh Hartnett or something, you know? <laughs> Who you would take. <laughs> like Jeff, yeah, like Jeff Bezos. Ew. He would not be the person I go to the moon with. Yeah. Well, Especially with that lazy look, eye. Compare him to other billionaires. <laughs> He's the better looking of the crop, though. Okay, really, but it doesn't really, have to be a billionaire. Really, really okay. the better looking one. <laughs> yeah. Look. Please, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> see, it's like, see, it's like, it doesn't matter as long as I'm looked after. That's cool. It doesn't really matter. doesn't matter to me. Ah, he can, he can. <laughs> Jeff, Money can fix he can the Jeff eye. Jeff Bezos at any time. <laughs> so. but, but this guy's already got money. He's got twenty-eight million bucks to waste on. A flight to space with Jeff Bezos, so he's already got money. Who else is going to drop twenty eight million dollars? I mean, so there will the guys- be six. Th- there'll be six people in total who will go on this inaugural human flight, um, mm-hmm. and so they thought for one of the spots they'll do this auction. Nearly seven thousand six hundred people from more than one hundred and fifty nine countries all over the world registered to take part in the auction. Mm-hmm. Perhaps some people just registered for the fun of it. But that makes me think a lot of people have some type of cash that they think would be able to win this type of auction. It took less than six minutes to reach this final bid of 28 million US dollars. So for now, the winner is unidentified. They haven't released their name. But we know that they've secured their spots. It's only going to be an 11 minute flight up into space. I mean, imagine this drops person- $28 million for an 11 minute flight. You really have nothing. You, you've run out of stuff to keep you happy in life. Yeah. So it, it, they're going to be spending roughly 2.7 million US dollars a minute just and, to sleep and be and- part of some history book around this. I mean, that's like a deflating balloon. They're like, yeah. mm. and then what? Yeah. And then what? Yeah, where do you go after that? And you, yeah. you're going to come back to, you see, he's thinking, oh, people will be so jealous. And when I get back to earth, I'll tell them my story. But once you've heard this <laughs> asshole telling the story for the 10th ten, time, you're like, oh, please, can you stop? What's his story going to be? It's not like he, you know, is going to get out of the rocket and go like hang out on the moon and, you know, meet a little terrestrial being up there and then come home with this like sweet no. ass story. It's gonna be like I was in a rocket. It was really fast. The end. Or, exactly. or maybe it's it's trying to pay money to be closer to to Jeff Bezos. I assume they no. won't just meet on that day. No, they, Perhaps they there's might. some safety procedures and classes. So you're getting close to Jeff Bezos. Mm. It might also and be. What are you gonna be rocket friends? I mean, the, the, Look, the, the explanation is uh-huh. this guy is, is he wants to he wants to be remembered. You know, a lot of people are trying to be uh, remembered. They're trying to leave a legacy. They want the world to remember them when they're gone. Maybe th- this guy has a better chance of being remembered when he's gone than any of us. And maybe that's why he's doing it. Maybe it's important for him and he wants to spend his money doing something wild that only six other humans have done. And then it can go on his tombstone, you know, like went to space. Speak for yourself, Gareth. I'm going to have a country and I'm going to be queen and I'm going to have a national anthem. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather you, have a you, country and national anthem than go to space. Mm. But if you don't want to think of Jess, Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos, excuse me, Jeff Bezos as like a, a douche for doing this, they uh, plan this whole auction, though, so that money can be raised to go to the Club for the Future Foundation, which was created by Jeff Bezos's rocket company, Blue Origin. And it goes into funding STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, to help mm-hmm. young people and future generations get into yeah. 
um, being interested in what happens out yeah. in space and studying. I love the way all these space. people. This is like um, you know billionaires. He's he's got this rocket that's going in space because he's he wants to go into space because for him it's a cool thing. He's got like a hard on for going into space. But then he builds this foundation on the side so he can seem like a good person, like he's helping people along. It's like those guys mm-hmm. who cycle. They enjoy cycling from like Joburg to Cape Town, and then they tell all of us we have to pay money. So that what makes you think we, that's not a good? I I I I hear it. It is good, and I'm sure that there are lots of kids who will benefit from this foundation. But it's because he wants to go to space that he started the foundation. It's like people who enjoy running, and then they say to you, "Won't you sponsor my run so that we can help some child who hasn't got a liver?" And you're like, like "Well, no, I'll just pay to sponsor just, that child." I could just help the child to get a liver. I'll just give the money straight to the child to get a liver. Why do I have to help it sponsor your stupid run? You know? Although if I was running other- after money, I would then run. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> win up. <laughs> <laughs> I will pay you to run. I'm in. Yeah. Um, apparently, uh, here we go. Uh, Sanele says they're going to spend 11 minutes discussing how they will take over the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> If you have 28 million US dollars to drop on a trip like this, you probably have loads more where that came from. So it's someone who I assume then is also trying to take over the world. I honestly am having a scene of like Pinky and the Brain in my head of this rocket ship going up and be like, what are we going to do today, Pinky? Same thing we do everything. You know, try to take over the world. I've got a video I want you to see. This is just going around on social media, and I want to hear your comments on this. You, you and uh, Jasmine were both talking about Botox earlier. Well, makeup is just as deceitful. Take a look at this video of this really, really ugly woman. I'm sure you've seen it. And she turns into this beauty. Watch this. It goes on and on and on. and she looks horrendous in the beginning and then at the end she looks absolutely beautiful uh-huh. This is why men don't trust women. I just want to speak on behalf of all women. That's how we all look in the morning. Okay. Uh, don't like, judge like, us. Like she does in the beginning. <laughs> Do you know that I put makeup on today because I know my mother's going to watch this and I will mm. get a phone call and she will say to me, yeah. Do you have makeup on today? <laughs> Did you do your hair? I'll walk into my mother's house and be like, Why are you wearing that? I'm a 35 year old woman. Why tell me what you wear? Sorry, mom. Sorry, I won't do it again. Um, <laughs> yeah. now, that you, now that you bring that up, I thought about the story the other day. There was, um, you know, the comedian, um, what's her name? Uh, Mo- Monique. You know Monique, the comedian, right? Mm-hmm. So Monique went on social media and she went on a rant about how people are dressing since COVID and how badly, how, what slobs they are, how horrible they look. <laughs> No, really, how horrible they look because they're wearing like sweatpants at the, at the airport and they don't brush their hair and people haven't brushed their teeth and people just look like they've stumbled out of bed. And I do think that we have to smarten up again post-pandemic because people do look like shit. I went to the shop the other day and there were, there were like people walking around in matching track pants and hoodies. And although I suppose that's fine if you're at home, you can't be like that in public. Wait, are you talking like a full like tracksuit? Like that gray material, you know that gray fabric that they make those alcoholic pants out of. The 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 the, the, the pants that alcoholics wear when they're at home on their own. <laughs> you know which ones I mean? You know, I have them right <laughs> near me, so I was gonna bring them to camera, <laughs> but now since you said it's alcoholics, I'm not bring sure. Them. I want I have those pants. <laughs> bring them to you. 
Just bring them out. Uh, you know which ones I mean. Bring them here. Do you have alcoholic pants? Listen, I've never seen alcoholic pants, but I will often say to people, that person has a body like an alcoholic. That's, that's the stuff. See, has just held it Those up. Those are like up. regular cotton track exactly. pants. Exactly. Regular sweatpants. Everybody has them, but they are alcoholic pants. That is it. And are you why, do you feel, the why do you think they're alcoholic pants? Because I've seen alcoholics wearing them during the week when they're meant to be at work because they wear those when they drink on their own at home. And are you talking about the fact that I wore matching top as well? To yeah. go to Do you have a matching top? Yesterday? I was just, because See? I have a matching tracksuit. And I mean, oh I don't, God. now I'm not going to go out in it because I'm going to think, okay, well, if Gareth thinks that way, other people are going to be like, that girl's got a drinking problem. Okay, I didn't look, there is in the wine aisle again. Oh, there's yeah. old wine Jasmine. And and we were just we were talking about your your gin this morning. People are totally convinced you're an alcoholic. I know. Person. I'm just like so, I don't want to turn my camera so you can see my wine collection. Jesus. Yeah, no, now now that connotation is not good. Gareth and Jasmine, oh do you guys God. have absolute would never be seen out in public wearing this clothing? Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Really? Yeah. No. I have Don't. I have a bunch of um I have a bunch of of t-shirts and there's certain like I don't own Crocs I would never own Crocs but if you wear those out in public you need to be you need to be really you know embarrassed about that I also think that slippers you know those slippers with like uh, we spoke about them the other day those warm ones that you wear around the house when it's cold in winter um, would the, never be seen the, out in the, public with the lamb, lamb. Yeah, it's got the lamb's wool stuff on the inside, yeah. and then the yeah, those ones. They're quite expensive now. I think they're like eight hundred bucks a pair. Oh. They used to be like two hundred rand a pair. But anyway, mm. those you can't, you can't wear those out when you go shopping. Please, you you don't wear. I've shopping. seen people out in those all the time. No, no. You know what I've got a problem with? You know yeah. what I got a problem? Oh my god, I've got such a big problem with this. So I don't care if Get people wearing this. My biggest, biggest, uh, probably like my biggest gripe is if people wear open toe shoes and their feet are completely unkept. Oh my God. You know, like when the toes are like, this is the end of the shoe, and then their toes are like, and their toes are like like gripping round. (laughs) And you can plow a farm with their toenails. I can't. (laughs) No, but (laughs) the toes are there before the rest of their feet. So this, this video of, of Monique, I mean, I wish I had it here. Someone sent it to me, and I just can't find the damn thing anywhere. But um, see, I see if you can find it somewhere, because okay. you've got to hear how she says it. She's pretty uptight about it, and, and like, please, people. She goes, please, uh, let's all tidy ourselves up. You know, co- COVID's now coming to an end. We need to be presentable. See if you can find that. Anyway. Uh, um, there's an Asian man who sued his wife for giving birth to an ugly child, and um, MM believes that he was within his rights. He'd married a hot woman. Turns out that they'd had plenty of plastic surgery, and then the kid came out very ugly. So, yes, you see? Um, Christine is trying to stand up for you, Sia, and for other people who wear alcoholic pants. Christine says, street fashion is the trend now, so Sia's tracksuit is cool. You do not... Listen, if you're just going to the shops and you think you can get away with it, like let's say you're going to the garage shop to buy some milk or whatever, fine. Right. But if you're, if you're actually going shopping in a shopping center and you're going to be around other people and you might bump into someone you know, what an, what an embarrassing situation that would be if you're in alcoholic pants and like slippers. Uh, there's a way in which to wear the tracksuits though. I watched a video the other day and they, this woman was kind of, talking about if you want your tracksuit to look really expensive so you have to wear if you wear in a if you're in a, a black tracksuit you have to wear white sneakers and if you're in like a white or gray tracksuit you have to wear black sneakers and then you have to pull your pants up like really high so if, mm-hmm. oh, now you can't see hold on so these are your track pants and then you've got to like pull and then tuck in and then okay. you've got to all your track pants like up to above your belly button and then she's like mm-hmm. then you look all swag and fancy like in in a track suit so see ya, you can go out in an alcoholic track suit because you're going to be looking like a kardashian look, yeah there know. are there are times and situations for all of this but they're also 
you might be having a bad day. You might be, you, you know, you might be in a rush. You, people must mm. just not judge. I have, yeah, I've, I've had judge. some moments. We will judge. It's like you can't get drunk at nine in the morning, no matter how bad your life is. You're oh. not allowed. You can't start drink, drinking in, in the week in the week at nine in the morning. You have, right, nobody mm-hmm. drinks mimosas at night, Gareth. <laughs> oh, I'm talking to two problem people here, clearly. <laughs> I just think that <laughs> the most of them for the breakfast time. There's some basics that you shouldn't, no matter how bad the world is around you or how bad your life is in the world, it's you're really giving up when you start doing, you know, and, and wearing certain things. I, I, I hate being judgmental, but in this case, I think I'm perfectly justified to say this. People do judge. And they will judge you harshly if you if you go out in a tracksuit to do the shopping and slippers, for God's sake. I, I'm, I'm with Monique. Tidy yourselves up. That's what she I says. I draw the line at tracksuit and slippers. Like, pick one. Mm. No, yes. you can't wait. No. no. Sia, like, Sia's listen, really done I, wouldn't, I, I don't agree. I mean, if I ever left the house in slippers, my mother would, oh, my God. I mean, they, that would be problematic. That would send her into a grave. But um, I think if you're going to go out, don't go out in like full sleep loungewear. Don't go out in your slippers. That's like people, I have seen people go out in like their socks, like Sif. Gross. See, uh, so Michelle, Michelle says, I saw a lady in a, in a mall wearing yoga pants and a bra and no top covering her bra. Hmm. Okay, no, no, no. Like no. a bra? No, they've yeah. lost the plot yeah. then. Ke- uh, Kevin says, Matching track pants and hoodies are the trend right now. It's called a co-ord. See, Gareth, yeah. Kevin, you know what you're talking about. And um, you've got to wear it high waisted. FPB says, uh, Sia, if you wear the track suit in public, at least you won't get confused with an Armenian. Armenians oh. apparently wear track suits uh, all over the place. Um, people who go to pick and pay in onesies, cringe. That's according oh. to Jen. Inflatables. Yes, that's bad. You know what? Okay, um, let me try to make sense with my point. Okay, do not sound like a total okay non a brain, but mm-hmm. I think it's about if you look together somewhat mm. decent or moderately presentable, then it's fine. Mm. I think if it is a if it's you, you know you're stopping at a garage with a little store inside and you will already just you were lounging at home with a cute onesie that's in good condition that doesn't mm-hmm. have a hole in its leg mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. you're dashing in and you're dashing out and you have a clean face and you've brushed your teeth i think that's somewhat acceptable if you are rocking up to the garage with a t-shirt that you slipped in that's bright orange and pants that are like a you know muddy brown and you you're just you look like a slob then that's totally different if you look put together like i i like loungewear that's all i live in when okay. i'm home yeah, get, so at least get really, i look put together so my closet a couple of years ago so i only wear black white gray and navy blue those are the only colors that i wear mm-hmm. i have colorful shoes and i have colorful bags so that's where i get an accessory so i, I colorful accessories but all of my loungewear, my, I mean, all of my comfortable clothes are acceptable to go out in. So I have oh, okay. like, like, a, oh. like a beautiful black tracksuit or I have a beautiful gray tracksuit, but I'll always, mm-hmm. you know, do your hair. So I think if you're going to pick items, don't go buying like slob, like there is, there is red loungewear and then there is like really <laughs> shitty loungewear. Exactly. And then it's like, like, it looks like you're wearing your grandpa's pants. You know those old tracksuits with like the cuffed ankle, and then it gets those little bollocky things on it. Yeah, Do you know what yeah. I'm talking about? Like your grand, like your granddad used to walk around. That shit. Don't be wearing that shit out. Like sis. Oh my god. Like have some self respect. Have some self respect. You. You're we've welcome. Made, we've we've made no progress here because I still disagree, and so does Monica. She says uh, completely agree, Gareth. There are certain standards we should uphold. Otherwise, when does it stop? And here's a good point from Gen X who says, my grandma has pictures of herself back in the 50s wearing high heels, a hat, makeup, a beautiful dress, and that was just to go and buy groceries. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
I mean, that's what my mother expects of me. Um, in the hood, women get into fights in their gowns and slippers, says in DP. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, of course. You know, there's nothing that I love more than it seems so now slightly condescending, but I really don't mean it like that. There's nothing that I love more than, for example, when I go and visit my grandmother in Lazi, you know, when mm -hmm. I'm there and maybe I stay over the night. And yeah. when you right in the morning, when you wake up, you just see like these little groups of women standing by the fence or standing by each other's front gates and they're just in a gown and a duck some yeah. have some th some stuff still smeared on their face and you can tell right. this is like hot gossip that couldn't wait at all but they're all just standing there <laughs> yeah, yeah, the gossip they get together first thing in the morning they're still mist everywhere in yes it's the gossip gag just there yeah. standing around <laughs> Listen, I have a I have a group of women um, in my estate that last night uh, one of them messaged me and said, "Come over for some wine." And I was in my slippers and and a tracksuit, and the, another one was like, "Cool, I'll come pick you up." And she drove to come and fetch me, and then we just rocked, and we were all in our pajamas drinking wine. Oh. I mean, Sia, I still was plopping my hair because Sia, when Sia and I did test call last night, I had like a big t like. I use Richard's T-shirts to plop my hair. That's a, that's another topic. But it just I makes your hair all curly yeah, and beautiful. Know what it is, but okay, all right, yeah. Um, and I went, I went like that for drinks. But I mean, I opened my gate with with the gown on. I give rocks, but I mean, mm. I don't know if I'd go out in a gown. Oh, please don't, please don't. Oh, all right, we're going to wrap. Uh, we're going to wrap it up this morning with an episode of Blind History, and this is um, this is one of my favorite episodes ever. I don't know if you've if you've heard any of our Blind History jazz, but it's, um, mm -hmm. it's something we've been we've been doing five seasons of this show so far, and we're coming to the end of season five. There may or may not be a season six. We'll let you know in due mm -hmm. course. But you know, we we take suggestions from people, and this was one that somebody who listens to the series sent us. Um, a woman called Hedy Lamar. Have you ever heard of her? Mm -mm. She's going to be, after you've listened to this episode, one of your favorite people because she's become one of mine. Um, just the most incredible story. So obviously a lot of people today talk about sexism, not being taken seriously as, as women in the corporate or engineering world, for example. So imagine what that was like in World War II. Because Hedy Lamar was called the most beautiful woman in the world. And that was what they called her in, in Hollywood. In her own words, she actually wished they'd been more interested in her brain. In fact, you might actually be listening to us via technology that she helped to develop. And you might be listening to us on your phone, and there's a role she played in making modern technology that you use on your phone every day, a part of our lives. She's that incredibly clever or was. She died uh, just uh, a couple of years ago. But listen to this story. It'll blow your mind. It is the story of Hedy Lamar and its blind history. And blind history, of course, is brought to you by Taylor Blinds and Shutters. And uh, we, we, we're, we're just thrilled to bring you this episode. Anthony Meter and I both had no idea about who she was until we started putting this together. You're going to love Take a look at this. By the time she reached her 86th birthday, Hedy Lamar was in a sad state. Reclusive and reduced to a shadow of the beauty she once was, she left long, lonely messages on her children's answering machines. This sad end was made worse by the fact that she had lived a remarkable life that merged two seemingly impossible halves. She was an inventor and a pioneer of incredible technological advancements. But her high-profile life as a Hollywood actress meant that not many people took her seriously. So every now and then, we come across a name that neither Anthony or I have ever heard of. And it's rare that we get suggestions that somebody knows about that they really want to hear more about that you know we feel we can add anything to in this case we're going to talk about somebody who really should be a household name 
an incredible human being who managed to straddle two completely unrelated worlds, the world of movies and the world of science. And her name is Hedy Lamarr. This is an episode of Blind History. My co-host is Anthony Midera. And uh, I believe you've fallen in love with Hedy Lamarr. Sure, head over heels. Incredible woman. And I, you know, I didn't really know at all a lot about her. First of all, it's a wild story, but it's also sad, her story. And then finally, she gets recognition at the end of her life. She was a giant intellect. She didn't have during her life the kind of acclaim that she probably should have. She certainly did as a movie star, and she was magnificent. I mean, if you see her in any of her movies, and I've seen little clips on YouTube, what a beautiful woman. She was apparently the inspiration for Snow White in the Disney cartoon. Correct. And also Catwoman. And Catwoman. And now that I've seen her in these movies, I can see exactly why Snow White looks the way that she does mm. in the cartoon. I mean, Hedy Lamarr was called the most beautiful woman in the whole world at one point. And she was discovered, in inverted commas, by Louis B. Mayer. And we'll tell you that story. He was the head of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the famous studio, in a while. But there's this brilliant documentary that came out um, just recently about her scientific contribution to the world. And that is where it's not just a biography of Greta Garbo or Marilyn Monroe, who were all you know, exciting and interesting people in their own right. But this woman is just for her time and the diversity of her interests and her abilities. She's just head and shoulders above many other people in entertainment, if you'll pardon me being disrespectful to that particular industry. But um, she was born in, in Austria, and she was actually born, her, her real name is Hedwig Eva Maria Kisler. Now, Hedwig is not a great name, and she changed her name to Hedy Lamar on the insistence of Louis B. Mayer, and his wife gave her the idea of Lamar. Um, I think it comes from another a famous actress or someone who was famous in Hollywood before she came along. Yeah, in the silent era, and Barbara Lamar, who tragically died very young. Okay. You know, it wasn't great to be German or anything related to German in, in America in the 30s. <laughs> so, no. So uh, they definitely needed to get rid of the Kessler part of her name. Well, I mean, it's probably worth, before we even get to her life in America, just talking about the, the life she had in Austria. So she was born into this, this Austrian Jewish family. Again, not a great time to be in, you know, Eastern Europe during the rise of fascism as a Jew. And then she had a, a mother who was a concert pianist, an incredible woman. Her father was apparently a very, very smart man too. I think her dad instilled in her, you know, he was very attentive to her and they would go for walks into the, in the country and they would look at tractors and mechanical side. And he was a very curious man. They converted to Catholicism mostly to just preserve themselves. And she was interested in acting. She, at the age of 12, won a beauty contest. Wow, she had such massive self-confidence. 12 years old, her parents didn't know that she would enter into a beauty contest. She won a fur coat. She went into the movies and she did a movie called Ecstasy. And apparently Ecstasy was, you know, this is at the age of 18 years old. These days, we'd almost think of it as child exploitation. Ecstasy was a wild movie for its time. I mean, it was almost like softcore porn. And she always claimed that she didn't know this, but that they'd used um, extreme zoom lenses to, you know, show very provocative pictures of her and to get up close and personal with this very beautiful, very young woman. And it was a, a sensation everywhere except in Germany and the US where they banned it because they thought it was immoral. There had been nude pictures shown in a movie previously, but this was the very first time ever that there was an orgasm shown on a movie. How they did that, they pricked her with a safety pin, and that got the response out that they put on the movie with the orgasm. She got married quite young as well, and this is before she moved to America, and that was a very unhappy marriage, right? Yes. The, the big thing with the marriage is also plays out later in her life. He was an absolute asshole, and... His name was Fritz Mandel, and he was also from a Jewish background, but he was a fascist. He was a munitions dealer, and they called him the merchant of death. So he would sell uh, his munitions to the highest bidder, and he was friends with Mussolini, with Hitler, and with all the Nazis and fascists of the time. And when she was married to him, and that, as you mentioned, at a very, very young age, she used to sit in these dinner parties that they had, and these idiots just thought, he has my arm candy. She's going to sit there and just the dutiful wife. 
But meanwhile, she took so much information in and she had so much information later on in her life to be able to develop what we will talk about later with regards to frequency hopping. But that marriage was what we can see. It was scary. The thing that he fell in love with was the way she acted and the way she interacted with the world. And what he did was he took all of that away. So he put her in his hunting villa or palace or whatever it was in the country and he basically in seclusion, locked up. And in the end, it was a nightmare. So she, um, there are lots of different stories, but I think probably the closest to the truth is, funny enough, her maid at the time looked quite similar to what she was in terms of build and hair color. So she drugged her maid. This was just after a dinner party, but at the dinner party, she, she obviously asked Fritz if she could put all her jewelry on, which it's just weird that she even has to ask, but nonetheless. And then she, she drugged the maid and she dressed up in the maid's kit and got onto a bicycle and escaped. With all the expensive jewellery, she got on this bicycle and she escaped off to eventually to London. And that's where she met Louis B. Mayer. Correct. With Louis B. Mayer, it's a very, very interesting story. It just shows her massive self-confidence. Because when she met him, you know, he offered her, I think it was maybe 120 or $150 per day, which was an entry-level actor in, in Hollywood. And she turned him down. She didn't just turn him down. He offered then to take her on the ship with him back to America. And she said, no, no, don't worry. I'll do that myself. And she booked herself. She sort of almost double tricked herself because there was no space on the ship. So she went to one of her good friends that was in London at the time, and they helped her to get onto the ship as somebody that looks after a young 14-year-old child. But she never, ever looked much after the child. She kept trying to woo Maya. And in the end... He did, but they ended up during the trip spending a lot of time together. He was there with his wife, so it was nothing untoward. And she uh, negotiated him up to $500 a week. Him and his wife, especially his wife, they were extremely prudish. And I think the ecstasy movie, they were very scared of that. Well, she did arrive in the US with a bit of a reputation. And this also bothered her for the rest of her life because people basically treated her like a teen porn star. And they didn't give her much cred. She had that legacy, and so Maya controlled that to make sure she acted in things that were light-hearted. I mean, the studios controlled everyone's reputation in those days, and, and Hedy Lamar was protected as being this beautiful but innocent woman. And, I mean, even in Samson and Delilah, her biggest success, she wasn't like this dangerous seductress. You know, She was still this, this beautiful kind of almost virginal woman. And I suppose that's a part of Hollywood that we don't identify with anymore because Hollywood started to develop the reputation of particularly the leading ladies as being far more like sexually aggressive and, you know, far more independent. In those days, it wasn't like that. Yeah, 100% correct. And she just didn't like that whole setup in Hollywood. So that's why they always thought of her as aloof. But people that were very close to her said she's not at all like that. But she said, I don't have time for these type of things. And Spencer Tracy said, you know, I don't like working with Hedy because she's so aloof and difficult to get to know. And then she just said, look, you slur the whole time. I can't understand anything you're saying. She went on to do, and we don't have to go into a whole movie history, but she worked with everybody. Spencer Tracy, she worked with Frank Borzage, she worked with um, Clark Gable, Judy Garland, you know, everybody who mattered in Hollywood. But she was very different from the other girls because she had this European streak of kind of knowing what womanly independence was. And she didn't really like to mix with all of them. And she did become a bit of a recluse later on in life. There's a famous story about how she would, she would swim at her agent's pool high up in the Hollywood Hills, but she would never go to the beach or go into a crowd of people. If you asked her for an autograph, she would say, what do you want that for? I think she mentioned once, you know, anybody can be glamorous if they just stand still and look stupid. They discovered these incredible tapes um, that a friend of hers had recorded in an interview with her. And it's, it's quite spooky to hear her say the words, you know, a lot of people think I'm just this stupid thing, that I'm this beautiful woman who was in Hollywood and was in these movies and that that's all I am. And she said, I think people's brains are much more interesting than their looks. And that brings us to the thing that she should be most famous for, because her contribution is something that all of us use every day without even knowing that we owe it to her. Yes. And at the time, it was actually quite soon after she got there, you know, within the seven year period, she met Howard Hughes. He was a famous eccentric billionaire and he had his own production company, but he also had planes, his aeronautical factories. And for him to say she was a genius, it just gives you an idea. 
But he set her up in a trailer and she had her own drafting table and place where she could carry out her scientific experiments. And they had a great friendship. She said he wasn't a great lover, but once that was all sorted out and they realized they're going to be friends, he was a massive supporter of her. And I think that played a big role also for her future. Well, she's supposed to have invented many things, including a, a fizzy tablet that you could make Coca-Cola. It's like a compressed, concentrated Coca-Cola tablet that would also carbonate the water. Yeah, how clever is that? I mean, she said that she wanted this for the troops who were working on the front. Brilliant. She wanted it for people on ships. But the big invention was this frequency hopping radio messaging. Uh, essentially a form of communications technology which had not been invented. So where it comes from is that, and they say there was a personal motivation for her because her mother was coming across on a ship and many of these ships were being torpedoed by the Nazis. So what happens is you would send a radio message from the ship to the torpedo and these could be intercepted by the Germans and then they could figure out where the torpedoes were and they'd be unsuccessful. But what she figured out with this other guy, George Anthill, it was a joint patent that they filed is that you could do frequency hopping. Essentially, you could send a part of the signal on this frequency, then the next part on that one, and the next part on that one. So if it was intercepted, they'd only get a piece of the signal. And this was tremendous. They didn't actually put it to use during the Second World War, which is a shame because they could have saved many more lives. But they also disregarded her. They thought, well, she's a foreign national. She wasn't born here. So she may just be a spy. And um, they also didn't take her seriously because she was a woman and a Hollywood actress. They said, you focus on being beautiful, we'll focus on the science, thank you. And the, and the U.S. Navy missed out. And I thought, you know, being beautiful and being clever, is it mutually exclusive? I mean, <laughs> it was just crazy how these guys thought. But the funny thing about the Navy, once they turned it down, they carried on blundering along with the torpedoes. I mean, you saw Japanese ships coming into port with American torpedoes stuck into their stern without being active. Nobody cared about the American torpedoes because they weren't very efficient. So it was crazy that they didn't take that up. She tried to get onto the National Inventors Council, and um, she was told that she could better help the war effort by being a celebrity. So she said, okay, fine, I'll sell war bonds. And there was this dude in the, in the audience who she knew, and they had this game that they would play where she'd call him up and she'd say, if you guys buy a war bond, then I'll kiss him. And they raised millions. I mean, something Seven like- Seven million dollars in one day. Phenomenal, right? Just from I mean, her. Just from her kissing this dude on stage. And then of course he'd go back into the crowd and then they'd do it in the next town. And, and this is a way that they raised money for the war. So she was, she was also a, a conscientious citizen. She was trying to do her bit to support the war, which is absolutely amazing. Supposedly, her patent was filed in the category red hot, if you have any idea of what that means. It means that during the war, they were obviously prioritizing certain inventions over others. And they realized that there was potential for this thing to be used. And years later, it was actually used. At the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. By, by then, the poor woman's patent had expired, so she didn't earn a single cent from it. They say if, if we had to pay Hedy Lamar in the 90s, for all the inventions that would have been used by then and perhaps up to now, they would have had to pay us something like 30 or $40 billion for having come up with her part in this. Yeah, she stopped acting, I think her total career spanned 28 years. And I think after Samson and Delilah, she came off that. But sadly, the Hollywood studios would always want their leading actors to be happy and they would give them vitamins every day. And it was basically vitamin meth. And and she got addicted to the vitamin meth and she struggled with it a lot in her life. And obviously then her behavior became very erratic and she used to have quite a temper and that. So there's a lot of things about Hollywood that stands out for me that just, yeah, just very, very sad to read this. And the fact that they kept driving, beauty is your ticket, beauty is your ticket. Mm. This is what you're only here for. So she, she tried to preserve that and being how clever she was and loved to invent stuff, she started messing around with plastic surgery. So her face in the end did, take a pounding from that type of stuff later in life. And I think if you see the pictures of what she looked like later on in life, it's a very sad state of affairs. You know, she was obviously addicted to the idea that she had to be young and beautiful because it had been such part of her success early on. But she looks horrible at the end. It's very, very sad. Although, you know, even I have to say, you can see the beauty in those pictures. You can still see her in those somehow. Well, I mean, she was always very protective of her image. She sued a bunch of people through the course of her life for using, uh, you know, representations of her or her name. And um, sometimes they settled out of court with her quite successfully for, for her. She sued Mel Brooks. And I must be honest, I love Blazing Saddles. 
um, you know, that's a long, long time ago, 1974, but he named the character Headley Lamar, you know, in the, in the Blazing Saddles. It's so funny, but, and, uh, you know, he said, wow, I didn't even know she knew who I was. Famously, she also sued Coral Draw using her photo on the cover of its products as well. Through the middle part of her life, she was really broke. But in the end, she died with quite a fortune. She did leave, you know, a couple of million dollars when she died. But she died only in 2000. I mean, that's not even that long ago. She died at the age of 85. You know, it's, it's sad that she went into complete seclusion. And she used to, because she was so desperate to communicate with people, she would leave her children these very long phone messages on tape. And some of those are also quite eerie to hear now. And they've released a lot of them. You can find some of them online of her just leaving her children messages about what her life was and how she lived. And she said, you know, she's been kicked in the teeth a number of times, but you've just got to keep on trying and you've got to be yourself. And I think it's the saddest thing of all that we only now in, you know, the years after her death have started to appreciate what she's done because her invention of frequency hopping communications has been used in Bluetooth, which is on all of our phones, Wi-Fi is an iteration of that, although there have been developments since Bluetooth, and many of the other things that we take completely for granted that are based on that very simple idea. George Antill and her, you know, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for so much of the technology that we now take for granted. And she was the mother of Wi-Fi, that's what they're calling her, uh, the first woman to receive the Invention Convention's Balbi Gnass Spirits of Achievement Award, which is like the Oscars of the invention industry. And she was also inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for developing the frequency hopping technology. And this was done in 2014, so post her death. And the Frontier Foundation jointly awarded Lamar and until with their Pioneer Award in 1997. This was just before she died. So at least she had, before she died, she could see some recognition of what she achieved during her life. And you're being recognized not for her beauty, but for her mind. Well, I think it's probably great news that Gal Gadot is going to portray her in an Apple TV Plus series on her life, which hopefully will come out soon because that'll be amazing. And I really think that there's an undiscovered story here for many people. Certainly it was for me, which is just so fulfilling. As you said, it's a crazy wild ride. Being Hedy Lamar must have been extraordinary. Yeah, 100%. And you know, screw Mandel and screw Mayer. She stands tall now. Blind History is brought to you by Taylor Blinds and Shutters. All the episodes are available on the cliffcentral.com website and app, as well as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. There were lots of scientists who um, were asked about her. A lot of them said that she was just actually a spy and she didn't come up with these ideas herself. You know, she's just a beauty queen and, a, and an actress. How could she possibly have been smart enough to invent anything? And they sort of dismissed her, but you can almost see how the spy story might have been concocted by her presence in these meetings with these high-ranking Nazis and fascists. And she would have taken in that information and she probably would have been very worried about her own family. <laughs> 